Okay, today we go over differing possibilities of tone when performing early music and or historical music. We'll have a great interview with Dr. Andrew Crane, the Director of Choral Activities at Brigham Young University, and our composer profile is on Thomas Morley. Welcome to Early Music Monday. There's a really great scene from The Office where Angela is being really difficult, as always, and Phyllis is being reprimanded by Angela as to the type of cutlery that was purchased for a particular party. And Phyllis, Angela comes over to Phyllis and is like, I asked for forks. These are spoons. And Phyllis is trying out some new techniques on how to deal with difficult people. And so she just looks at her and she's like, I want to understand you, but I find it really difficult when you use that tone. And in the bloopers, she says tone really funny and it makes everyone laugh. And so when your singers aren't singing with good tone, just look at them and say, I want to understand you, but I find it difficult when you use that tone. I don't know. Maybe it's funny. Maybe it's not. <laughs> anyway, choral tone. As a master's student at BYU, for part of my library research class, we had to write, well, really collect a bibliography, an annotated 100-source bibliography. So I thought it was a research paper at first because I had never done anything like that. So we were assigned... Our, well, our assignment was to pick a topic, and then we were going to just collect a hundred sources that address that topic, and the topic couldn't have been used before. There couldn't already be a bibliography about this. And then we would annotate about one paragraph about specific pages, specific chapters, specific sections that addressed that topic from those 100 sources. It was a huge project. I ended up doing my bibliography on tone. There are, I feel like the 100 sources I gathered was just scratching the surface. There are so many resources and books about singing tone. You talk about the bel canto era and how that shaped singing going forward. We talk about what was tone like before the bel canto era. And so there's a lot, and there's a lot of different schools of thought. Um, as we'll get into a little bit later, different ensembles around the world sing with different tones, and it's totally acceptable. There's no one right way. And I hope that even though we're kind of talking about early music and historical music, that, you know, there's kind of these, well, you know, historical music should be done like this or done like this, and there's a lot of research, but they all say slightly varying things, and in the end, you have to do what's best for your ensemble and the the tone that you like the best. So that's the caveat to start. So in general, if you read the book A Choral Symposium, they go through kind of six different schools of thought when it comes to choral tone. And they're, they're very specific, like the St. Olaf School, the Father Finn School, the Westminster School, the Robert Shaw School. And they all have, you know, their merits. But I, I like to generalize them even one step further into two basic camps as I see it. You have the sing your own voice camp, and then you have the blend at all costs camp. Voice teachers often kind of portray that sing your own voice camp, and, well, I should say, the stereotype is that voice teachers promote the sing your own voice camp, 
and choir teachers promote the Blend at All Cost camp. This has created kind of a rift between choral conductors and voice instructors, but it doesn't have to be that way at all. There, there are compromises and language that we use as choral educators contributes sometimes to that unhealthy singing when we intend for them to sing healthy. And voice teachers hear the product and say, well, they're singing unhealthy. You, you're telling them the wrong thing. And we say, well, you're telling them not to blend, and it just kind of goes back and forth. But it doesn't have to be that way. When I think of choral tone, I think of two things. A full, healthy sound that is your voice, but that is clean. So when I say clean, I mean the vibrato is not wablato and not out of control. But I don't mean straight tone. So there's that buzzword, straight tone. When we think early music, a lot of us tend to think a narrow, thin, straight tone sound, kind of boy soprano sound uh, from the sopranos, and then every other section kind of mimics within their own tessitura. But that's not necessarily what I think when I think of a clean sound. Because, again, you can't really use... There's a difference between an opera chorus sound, which is really exciting and uh, most of the time is a healthy, full sound, as long as it doesn't get into shout fest. And, and having a... But that sound is not that useful for close harmonies and, and you know, these kind of more historically thinner textures that require more finesse to, in the tone. So, a healthy, clean sound is something that I strive for and what I think of. Now, that brings us to the point of vibrato. Dun-dun! The dreaded conversation of vibrato. So, I guarantee you, all of us, myself included, have had conversations with singers in class about vibrato. Even at a junior high, they're like, what is vibrato? I think I'm starting to get vibrato. They're like discovering. It's like puberty. And they're like, oh my gosh, my voice is shaking. And yet we have to kind of address it. And even all the way up then till the professional level of saying, okay, let's, let's vibrate a little bit vibrato, but let's make it clean. So everyone has talked about it. There is an article in Early Music America called Vibrato Wars by Judith Malafronte. And I will post uh, I will post that article in the on the Sound of Ages website. It goes on, it's called Vibrato Wars, Vibrato versus non vibrato in historical performance. And it's really fascinating. The research is mixed at best because there's a lot of research that and researchers, historians, musicologists that go through and talk about, well, they actually say that, you know, and they use terms from treatises from people who lived in those time periods going all the way back to the Renaissance about a shimmer in the voice or a shake in the voice or a tremor in the voice and there's some debate about whether that was a trill or vibrato and how do you tell the difference and how do you how do you do both of those and uh in the end it was really fascinating to me because in the at the end of the article it had a quote from a bass player named Stephen Lenning a quote that he used when instructing string players and singers alike he said Quote, please don't use vibrato to generate the tone, but only to warm or enhance it slightly after the fact. So I think for me, that, that's the key to the vibrato question. The vibrato can't create the tone. The tone can't be from the throat up 
just vibrato because then there's no air or core to that sound. There's no body. There's no depth. There's no kind of silver lining core tone of that fundamental pitch carrying through. Even in opera sometimes, like the flower duet, for example, you listen to Diana Damrau and she has vibrato, but the core and the tone, the fundamental pitch carries through so strong that even sometimes in the flower duet, these really tight thirds up high still ring with great overtones because the fundamental pitch is so strong. Again, coming from strong tone, core in the sound, which comes from healthy breath, healthy space and resonance, and then the vibrato is used as warmth, not the tone itself. That was really profound to me, and I think that that kind of perspective can really help. It, it already has helped my conversation with my students about what vibrato, how to treat vibrato in a choral classroom. Because then again, the vibrato can be slight, it can be subtle, but that fundamental core pitch is what creates that really clean sound. Because again, the vibrato, singers can manipulate their vibrato to slightly to make it quicker or make it slower, make it wider in pitch or more narrow in pitch. And if the vibrato is creating the tone, then there's no tone for them to manipulate. It's just vibrato for vibrato's sake. And I like to call that unwieldy wobblato. Because that's what it sounds like. Totally sounds like, you know, wobbly voices. So in Sound of Ages, I totally aim, and at the high school, I totally aim for a warm, full tone, but a clean tone as well. Because the singers can manipulate that vibrato to be clean and kind of match who's around them without putting tension into the voice. So for example, there's a huge difference in tone. This is kind of ex now stepping back out of the vibrato conversation and going back to just general tone. But there's a huge difference between the following groups. The Hilliard Ensemble, the Talus Scholars, Tenebrae, and a group like the Dale Warland Singers, or the, even the Robert Shaw Singers, for that matter. So the Hilliard Ensemble, their conductor has a philosophy that before the bel canto era in Renaissance time, they didn't sing that way, that it was much more of a raw sound, a raw human voice sound, much more chant-like, really, in everything. So if you listen to Renaissance recordings by the Hilliard Ensemble, you're he you'll hear that raw tone coming through. And it tunes really well because it's so kind of forward-placed, too and kind of pressed a little bit, but it creates this really cool kind of primitive effect that has merit. I have no idea. Again, I, I am a singer, but I would not consider myself an expert singer. But I don't know how you do that for long, sustained periods of time without getting exhausted and just rubbing your voice raw. I'm not sure the techniques behind that. I'd be interested if anyone listening has any thoughts about that, of how that's possible. So that's the Hilliard Ensemble, kind of raw, a little bit unbridled tone. Then you have the Talus Scholars, which I, I think would be the complete opposite end of the spectrum. It's a little thinner. The Sopranos especially have much more of that boy soprano sound that is not necessarily the most healthy, but it works for for their aesthetic. Uh, I, again, I don't know what it's like to be a soprano, as much as that may shock you. But I don't know how they do that for long extended periods of time without just like feeling so exhausted. And again, the epitome of what what most people think of early music, that straight tone, quote, unquote, air quotes, because the Talus Scholars have created so many recordings of these Renaissance pieces that a lot of recordings are, the definitive recording is by them. 
So I'd, I'd consider them on the other end of the spectrum. So on one side, you got the Hilliard Ensemble, and then on the other side, you got the Talus Scholars, this thin bel canto, but kind of narrowed boy soprano, sh- like shimmery harmonies or locking in tune and ringing, no vibrato, that sort of sound. So then somewhere in the middle, we get some of these other groups, like Tenebrae Choir from England. Now, they have a much more full core depth of sound, but it's still clean. The Sopranos, I was talking to one of the basses from Tenebrae after a concert of theirs that I was privileged to attend, and I asked him what it was like singing in Tenebrae. What is it? What draws you to the group? What do you like about singing for Nigel Short? Um, and he talked about how it's a chance to really sing. And he talked about how the basses and tenors get this chance to kind of really kind of let go. And because Nigel Short goes for the, the bass heavy sound, the pyramid, right? Sopranos thin at the top. Basses are the big, large bass of the pyramid that the sopranos sometimes have to sing off the voice. That is what he said. That was his word. Those were his words. Sopranos sing, sing a little bit off the voice, so sometimes it's a little frustrating for them, and sometimes it's a little bit challenging, but I love it. So that was interesting to me that to hear that, again, a lot of these English choirs go for that boy soprano sound that they grew up hearing and a lot of them producing, but the, the men have this way bigger body in the sound, and maybe that's from sheer numbers but if you listen even on some of their recordings that have one on a part two on a part there's still a much like deeper core to the tone than the talus scholars in my opinion and then you have the dale warland singers or the robert shaw singers and theirs are much more of singing your voice just sing your own voice and I will place you next to people who you naturally blend with and don't really worry about it too much. Sing your full voice. And that's not to say that those groups don't blend, because they do, but the blend is an altogether completely different sound. And I sometimes, in listening to the recordings, I tend to hear that more of a wablato, vibrato, creating the tone sound versus the tone being enhanced by, by the vibrato that I do in a group like Tenebrae. So, and then all choirs like fit on that spectrum somewhere. So ask yourself, where do you feel like your philosophy rests? Are you a straight tone or die kind of choral conductor or are you a sing your own voice and I'll put you who you blend by and then just sing and don't worry about the blend I don't think very many of you are on either of those extreme camps but it's helpful to ask yourself where you fit in that spectrum and how you can get a better sound a cleaner sound a healthier sound from your singers because as you'll see in our in the interview I do later with Dr. Andrew Crane, we talk about his experience as a professional singer and how if it's too if it's technically exhausting for too long of a period at a time, it's not that fun to sing. So how can we get the tone that we're looking for and help our singers sing in a healthy way to where they learn to love singing? That's when I loved, started to love choir. That was when I started to really love it, is when I started to get better at singing. In the end, again, like I said at the beginning, you have to go with the sound that you like, the aesthetic that you enjoy, and the sound that is healthy and fun for the singers to produce. So to give an example, I'll just play 30 seconds for you of A Sound of Ages piece. And I want you to pay attention to specifically the tone that they're singing with. It's that full singing, their full voice, but it's cleaned up a little bit with the effect of the vibrato not adding tension into the sound.
in that clip, you can hear the slight vibrato that you hear through the voices, but again, it's a very clean sound, and it locks really nicely, and it's still full, it's still healthy, no one's pressing, and you can hear the warmth that comes from lots of air support. Now, there's a disclaimer, because different age groups are going to be limited by vocal development. Junior high kids, their voice muscles are just starting to kind of develop, and high school kids is a little more settled. College students are are really settling, but still not quite there. Community choirs, they're settled now, so how can we adjust these kinds of principles in our instruction to kind of fit what they physically are capable of doing? And again, that's a, another conversation for another day and a whole new can of worms dealing with uh, the adolescent voice. But again, that clip illustrates that full-bodied, warm sound that is also a clean sound. And as we instruct using the right words and we understand the voice better, we can get our singers to sing with that full, rich, healthy, but clean tone. So there's just a brief, really brief breakdown about choral tone in historical music and early music. So many decisions to make, so many great resources. If you have any questions about resources, feel free to send us an email through the website. Um, Again, check out that article on Early Music America, Vibrato Wars, that will be posted on the website. Uh, We're going to turn next to our interview with Dr. Andrew Crane. He is the director of choral activities at Brigham Young University. And his previous appointments include the director of choral activities at East Carolina University and at California State University San Bernardino. Choirs under his direction have been invited and performed at ACDA conferences at the state level, the regional level, and the national level. And in 2015, he led the ECU Chamber Singers to a first-place finish in the 13th Maribor Slovenia International Choral Competition Gallus. They became the only American choir to win in the history of the contest. So he's a big deal. He is an editor of a choral series through Walton Music, and he's frequently a guest clinician for all types of different choral festivals, honor choirs, etc., He was my mentor during my master's degree, and I learned a lot under his tutelage. So here is the interview between myself and Dr. Crane from Brigham Young University. Thank you for coming on. Uh, This is Andy Crane. He is the conductor of choirs at Brigham Young University, the director of choral activities. So you have spent your career as an educator a professional singer and as a conductor of university, a high performance specialty choir. Um, What do you feel like are your musical priorities as a university professor? I think that um, one of the priorities is to expose the students to a wide variety of choral repertoire. So I conduct a kind of a 40 voice chamber choir let's say we do mostly unaccompanied things but within that kind of genre of choir you can still hit a lot of different periods and styles and uh, so I think it's important to expose them to a lot of those. Um, I also feel that the singing part of the instruction so teaching them how to sing and how to create uh, efficient vocalism. I think it's just a really big priority for me. So, so I look at choir as, as, as much of a sort of group voice lessons as I do, you know, performing literature. Um, you so know, and along, and along the way, oh, go sorry, go, go, oh, well, I was just going to ask, <laughs> go ahead. the delay is killing me. Yeah, um, fine. so how does that shape the decisions in programming that you make, especially the voice thing? Yeah, that's actually a really good question and and it shapes it a lot. And if I had to get on my soapbox a little bit, I think that more conductors should think about this. So rather than just conduct saying, oh, I like this piece, my choir can do this piece, 
I think, okay, yeah, but but let's think about the voices that we have and let's think of how it's going to feel on the horrible. I try to stay away from a lot of high-lying tessitura in the soprano ones where, and, and there's a lot of music that really is written this way, especially like in contemporary British choral repertoire, just sort of where sopranos post on like a high <laughs> F for, for like many beats. And, and I just, I yeah. mean, yeah, technically like my students can do it, but I just think it's not very wise to make them do that. Um, so that's just like a small example, or, you know, if, if you've got, uh, a tenor section that needs some help in sort of the connection and uh, support side of their voice. Maybe that's not the time to do that piece that really right. features a tenor section solo kind of spot where it needs to be really heroic, at least not at that point in the semester or something. Right. Or maybe wait till later or maybe wait till another year. Yeah, exactly. So, like, I always am thinking about that stuff when I program. Does that – so, because I've been your student, I I can see really clearly how that's benefited me and how even through negotiating historical rep, is there mm -hmm. – are there characteristics about certain time periods that you feel, like, is trickier, like, is – is Renaissance trickier than a certain other time period because of those things? Or do you feel like the voice has stayed relatively consistent throughout time? Yeah, that's good. Um, I think that within every musical period or genre, there are traps and things to be aware of, right? And that just like there are things that are really, that feel really good. So like, I mean, you mentioned the Renaissance. I think if like, a, a sir, mad English madrigal, ten, like of the fa la 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 variety, tends to right. like fit pretty nicely in the voice, right? Yeah. Whereas the Misa Pape Marcelli of Palestrina, that's a bit, that's a different animal, and you know, much a much yeah. different kind of sing. You know, just like uh, in the Romantic era, well, to ask your small choir to sing Brahms Requiem or Verdi Requiem is different than, than right. singing a, a Brahms part song or a folk song arrangement or something. So I just think within every period, there are those issues to consider. Yeah, that's awesome. So to shift gears a little bit yeah. from, from you as the conductor in relation to the singers, you as the conductor in relation to the audience, when you're programming a concert, kind of talk us through your process. What, what are some factors you like to think of? What do you start? When do you feel like yeah. you've gotten it or whatever? Yeah. I mean, and I, you know, it's never like perfect. Right. So I, right. I, I have a certain way I do this, but sometimes I finish it and like, yeah, that wasn't perfect, but sometimes it does work better than others. But anyway, first of all, you got to consider the event for which you're mm. programming. Is it a, you know, is it a Christmas concert? Is it a concert in celebration of some historic moment? Or, you know, so that, that plays into it. And then, um, you know, a lot of people uh, start, have this thematic programming um, scheme. And I, I both agree with that and don't agree with that. So I think that if you uh, construct a concert that is based solely on some kind of uh, esoteric text thread like everything's about the journey of an artist from their beginnings through their develop like there's some weird like thing where all your texts right. have to do with some where it only really makes sense in your head as a conductor and not the audience i just don't buy those kind of themes yeah. however i i uh, there are other themes that i think that are more easily understood you know a concert of americana or um, a concert of uh, multicultural music or, or whatever it is, you know, just something that, or, or about love, like some kind of sure. really, I, I think for me, I mean, I know a lot of people will disagree with me on this, but I think the audience, they only get one chance at this thing. And so yeah. if, if that theme isn't obvious, I just don't think it works except in your own head as the conductor. Mm. So I'm thinking about that. And then I'm thinking about variety you know, uh, just a lot. That's one thing I 
like to do is making sure no two pieces sound the same. You know, I think about what instruments I'm using throughout, thinking about keys, are the keys different? So there's just a lot of kind of difference throughout the program. So those are some of the things that I would say. Yeah, sure. And I think that's great because I, I agree in the fact that it's like if if the audience can come with you on the journey, then they'll buy into your choir. The whole point is yeah. for, for me and my perspective, it's not just about, well, look how good we are. So support us because right. we're good. Whether you're an educational uh, institution or a private institution, doesn't really matter. You still want people to come to perform for. So if you can connect. So I guess another question is, where do you find the balance? Do you think of it differently or the same when you're programming for what are my singers going to think versus what's the audience going to think? Mm-hmm. And do, do those weigh different amounts? Yeah, I do consider both of those things. And it's tricky because I think the thing that I fight perhaps in BYU singers is um, what the, uh, like I think about the audience and maybe what they're going to appreciate isn't always the same thing that BYU singers will appreciate. Like Mm. BYU singers, many of them, maybe not all of them, if they had to like say what they really wanted to sing all the time, it would probably be something that to many lay person audiences isn't the most immediately appealing. Right. Uh, Especially when you have singers like me, do (laughs) five. Right. Right, Exactly. And frankly, like I'm the same way. Like I want to, that's what I'd rather do is this really sort of high, I don't know, high art kind of music. Whereas, right. And we do do that. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, that's that's a big part do, but it can't be all that because then the audience doesn't want to come. And so I'm always trying to balance that. Um, but it is tricky, and I've noticed that as a professional singer too. Like, um, for example, in Santa Fe Desert Chorale Christmas concerts, you know, the, the the conductor really does program a lot for the audience, mm. and um, and that's fine. And then he sells out audiences. You know, sure, it's really quite amazing. But there are only like two or three pro- pieces on the program that we, as the singers really really want to sing the other right. one's fine and we'll see them, but like you know we look forward every night to do that one <laughs> motet or whatever and, yeah and, and that's just the balance you gotta, you gotta fight you know uh, we have to keep the the art to survive you know and we right. have to pe- we people have to watch us perform yeah so we got to consider that but people need to sing in our ensemble too so you got to consider that as well yeah and it's actually really funny because i i I found myself in the middle of those exact same debates in my composition classes because Mm. we would talk about people like Schoenberg all the time and then people like people like John Rutter or versus like Kenneth Layton or Owen Park of today. Owen Park's a little bit more academic. John Rutter's a little bit more like um, what they call populist. And Mm -hmm. some, some people, whether they're composers, conductors, or singers are like, in extremes just one camp we are going to do high art because it is my art and i'm going to do it and i don't care who listens versus we're going to do whatever sells no matter what even if we don't do high art and i think that you're right to find the balance because you keep the art growing while bringing the audience to it a little bit is something i also agree yeah it's it's a really interesting i mean i remember talking to somebody in that field you're talking about this sort of esoteric new music field and Mm -hmm. We were, we were talking about this very principle that you're describing. And this person said, it's just two different worlds. They said, my goal as a composer is if they come to, if they come to my concert, my re- like my recital of my music or whatever, mm-hmm. I'm happy if there are 15 people in the audience and that after the intermission, uh, over half of them have come back after, wow. you know, for, the, for the second half. And yeah. they said that I would feel like that was a success. And I was wow. like, oh, <laughs> and, he, and they weren't even being facetious. Like that sure. was a real thing, which is so not the world that I live in. Right, you know? right. And I think, so. I think a lot of, and, and I don't know, I'm just projecting, but a lot, of, a lot more composers may feel that way than, than conductors. And yeah, you gotta, probably. Yeah. You got to find the, the balance. But that actually kind of leads into my next 
to follow up on you talking about Santa Fe Desert Corral and your experience singing in Seraphic Fire and some of these other groups, what are some things that you look forward to, whether it's pieces of music and what about those pieces of music? Like, yeah. what, do you, what do you love to sing and why? Well, I mean, there's a couple of different ways to answer that question. So like the professional choir thing, one of the greatest things that I look forward to is actually hanging out with my friends because I, regardless of what group it is around the country, it's the same basic people, right? That are right. singing. And, and so, and so that's really great to just see them and, and, you know, you haven't seen them in six months or a year or whatever, and you get to see them and that's just really fun. But that's, if the music weren't there, that wouldn't, I would still wouldn't do it or whatever, you know, right. but so the, the music is, is a big draw. And I honestly, like, I'll just, the, the pieces that I look forward to singing, there are typically uh, the pieces written by composers whose names you read in your Grout Norton, whatever music book when you studied, like, you know, yeah. if I opened up my folder and there's a Mendelssohn uh, psalm setting, I'm like, I'm really excited. If if there's a piece of Victoria, I'm I really can't wait to sing that. You yeah. know, if there's whatever folk song arrangement, I'm less excited about that. I mean, I really sure. want the sort of meat and potatoes stuff. Um, yeah. However, on the other on the other hand, like I've sung Rachmaninoff Vespers several times with a number of different pro choirs and i i have a i really don't enjoy that piece because it's really really hard to sing right. um and so whenever I, I get engaged to do a rock vespers i'm just like oh this is going to be really taxing it's just sure. the way that it's composed and stuff so that's not to say that every single piece written by a historically relevant composer hmm. is equally exciting but but certainly that's one good benchmark to use over arrangements or sure or flash in the pan pieces that have been written recently. Yeah. Kind of. And I guess that's true for me too. I, I look back and some of my least favorite pieces were the ones that were just like, man, I, my voice just hurts. Even when I'm singing well, right. like, it's just like exhausting right. at the end. So, yeah. Yeah. so I guess that leads to kind of one of my last questions is when you're, if, if you were, well, a, actually it's probably a couple questions. How do you introduce a piece that you think is going to be less accessible to the choir? What, mm, what, what yeah. are some tricks that you've used to introduce a new piece? Yeah, so I think that, I mean, there's a lot of different ways, but I think one of the basic things that I, I tend to come back to is finding a part of that piece. And it could be in the middle, it could be the end, it could be any part. And, but it's something about that piece that's very attractive like whether it's a chord cluster or a melody or a rhythm or something, even if it's like four bars that are very um, attractive. What's another word for that? Uh, compelling. You appealing. Know, yeah. Appealing. Yeah. And, and starting there, starting with whatever that little nugget is that the students can just latch on to, and that makes them kind of become excited about that. And if you can if you can sell them with that, well, then when you get to the hairier spot three days from now, they have some goodwill built up. Sure, that'll mm. that'll make them want to you know get the other the the harder stuff. Um, I also think that with any piece, uh, the more detail that you as the conductor bring to the interpretation, um, the more that the students learn to respect it. Um, Mm. like even if it doesn't if it's not like ear candy at first well if you've got such a nuanced interpretation of it and you know exactly where you want to go with it and you take them on the, that journey of the interpretation that is appealing yeah you know? that's and so cool. and so sometimes the the students by the end of the experience with that piece i mean they're all bought in even if the audience is like that, that was my least favorite piece you know right but i but you can you can you can get students to buy into something. Yeah, what well, that's actually yeah, again you hit it right on the head for like I feel really similarly. I'm not I don't think that I'm like some expert, but I did do really well at that. My whole my junior high kids did all of Britain's Ceremony of Carols, and right. they still ask to do it because 
I, I talked to him about how the whole thing goes and how it was composed and, yeah. and why he did it and how he loved it. And, and so I think that's really awesome. But then yeah. I guess my last question is how do you then, what are some extra or non-musical things that you f- have found successful as an audience member, a conductor or a singer to pitch that to the audience then that one, that um, next step? Uh, I mean, I think, and I, I'm still learning about this kind of stuff because I'm finding that the more that time goes on, the more you got to do this. Like, it's not just about sounding nice and having, even having good repertoire, like audiences just sort of need more. So uh, I think that I used to be for many years, very reluctant to talk to the audience. Um, I I just thought it was unnecessary and it was awkward and stuff. And so, but, and I, and I've seen, I, I saw this in professional choirs where, where, where certain pieces needed to be explained or, or, mm-hmm. or given context to. Yeah. And it's very, it's very yeah. tricky how you do this as a conductor because nobody wants you to turn around and just be like, this piece was composed in 1619 <laughs> for the sure. blah, blah, Monday, Thursday. It's like you've got to <laughs> right. find a little nugget. And like, I think interesting, like when you say something like, as you're listening, be, listen for the, you're going to hear little points of light that, that resemble stars. So I invite sure. you to, so there's like something actually like that's, that's making sense to them. And so I actually, because I'm not the best extemporaneous speaker, like I will write down on a, I'll write down my little script yeah. and read it verbatim. Uh, Roz Hall is so good at the other way. Like she can just speak. Yeah. It's uh, just, <laughs> off the cuff and it sounds like yeah, it's great. published prose <laughs> yeah exactly and i'm not that way so i have to write it down but i really am thoughtful about what i write down for that i also think that i've seen some choirs recently do uh like what do you call it super titles and have yeah. the text, even when it's in english like yeah. having the text projected which is kind of cool i've seen uh visual presentations like in the background which i think can be cool um you know, different things you can do with lighting, you know, where, where this piece has a different lighting than, than that cool. piece. And like I said, I'm, I'm learning that kind of stuff even at this point in my career. I think it's exciting to explore that kind of thing um, because I think more and more audiences are going to require that kind of thing. Right. And especially when, especially during the like shutdown, it, for me, classical music, regardless of the ensemble is being viewed through the same lens that popular music is viewed through. So, you know, like what's the newest Taylor Swift song? Right. <laughs> what is, what does she do for her music video? How does she release a CD? Are, are you going right. to release your song a similar way? You can, right. you can really do a lot. I think that this is a really cool opportunity to think more like the popular music world and get yeah. Just like I think Eric Whitaker did to start, right. like choir right. music became cool again through just right. the music, but now we can take it a step further and right. do that. So yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. So to to end, um, just is there any any sort of like soapbox advice that you would give to public school conductors? In I mean, you've been there. And now you're in the university realm, you sing in the professional realm. Are there things you've learned from the, those realms that public school teachers can apply? Yeah, definitely. And I don't, and I don't know who, who's going to hear this or like, I don't want to be offensive. <laughs> sure. I mean, I, I have a lot of soapboxes and I'll give you a few, but I, like you said, I, my first job was a high school teacher and, and I feel like my whole career I have, continued to work with high school students, even if that's not what I do 24 seven, but I, I sure. do so many honor flyers and stuff. But um, yeah, here's a few things in no particular order. The first one that I wanna say is stop complaining about your situation. Meaning mm-hmm. your school doesn't have financial support. Your administration doesn't understand what, you're, what you do. Your counselors don't put kids in choir. Like, everybody has challenges everybody yeah totally I, and so and it's just to me to to complain it doesn't help right and i think the way that you can get out you're only worth as much as you get yourself out of your bad situation and 
Yeah. I was really converted to this when I took my, I, I had a choir in California that I took on tour to a really, really poor, um, low socioeconomic area of, of like near Oakland, California. Sure. Um, just terrible facilities, uh, rough kids. Yeah. Anyway, and they opened their mouth and sang Palestrina Motet so beautifully, so expressively. And I was like, look at this teacher who, against all odds, like you could sit yeah. there and complain about, go down the list of what's wrong with his situation. But he just like didn't care. And he just said, we're going to do this. And the kids loved it. And it's because that teacher didn't just complain, but, yeah. but worked hard and, and made something out of it. So that's one. Uh, another thing would be to not be afraid of giving them music that stretches them. I'm not saying you have to give them like Poulenc mass, but just give them <laughs> something that don't just go through your pepper catalog and say, okay, well, what's the newest like uh, frozen arrangement that I can do right. so, that, so that, so that they're excited about it. Like, yeah, you got to do a couple of those kinds of things, but, but like, advance the art by yeah. it, by by presenting repertoire that that is well crafted and that will stand the test of time or has stood the test of time yeah and i think if you're um, only yeah. using music to recruit that's a losing right. game for right. sure right that's right because you'll always run out yeah absolutely um i would also say and this isn't just public school but this is my university colleagues too. Like, don't don't stop learning. Like, you're never perfect at your job. Like, mm. that, and that's part of the fun of, of the job is like changing and learning and growing and and learning from other people and stuff. Especially when it comes to the singing part. Mm. Um, I just I just see, and I don't, and maybe it's just my perception. I just feel like. In our in the choral profession right now, there's a lot of stuff that we're talking about, stuff that we feel is important, you know, that it things that just don't have to do with the singing. Like, right. like uh, I don't know whether it's your, you know, your you got to really pronounce this word a certain way, or like your diction, and that's all. That's fine. That's that's good. Or or what uh, you know, am I gonna wear on stage? And yeah, all that's fine. But it's like. They're not singing well. They haven't even been, they haven't even talked about singing well. Yeah. And, and after all, this is a, an art form of, of the voice. And so like, right. it just makes no sense to me if you don't know how to teach your students to sing. Now, I'm not suggesting that you as the choir teacher need to be Pavarotti or you need to be some sure. great singer. In fact, none of us is, right? We're all just pretty good singers or, or better than some or worse. But you've got to know something. You've got to know right. how the voice works and, and, and be able to make that part of your instruction. So yeah. I guess those would be some of my soapboxes. That's awesome. Cool. Well, thank you again so much for, for doing yeah. this interview. I, I agree with you in the let's never stop learning. So that's why I love for this podcast to have as many interviews as I can because I right. think – for most people, including myself, the discussion brings about the most new ideas and, right. and it's just refreshing. So thank you for your time and uh, maybe we'll have you on again in the future sometime, so. Yeah, no problem. Composer profile today is Thomas Morley. If I was introducing Thomas Morley to my students, I would introduce it, especially my junior high students, well, really high school, I would introduce him as the Taylor Swift of the Renaissance, the British Renaissance, because... He was definitely more famous and more well-known in his lifetime and after for his secular 
works, his madrigals, his airs. And they're so ridiculous to, for lack of a better word, of just heartbreak and very Shakespearean, you know, we'll talk about a piece in a second called Leave Now Mine Eyes, like telling your tears to, to leave your eyes, just like, get out of me, this, oh, poor me, kind of drama, which when I think of that kind of drama, I think of Taylor Swift. Drama just kind of follows her around. So it'd be a really great segue to teach Thomas Morley. Now, Thomas Morley kind of ushered in the golden age of the British Renaissance. He did write really, really good secu- or sacred music as well. But again, he wasn't as well known for that and didn't write as much of it. So he most likely studied with William Byrd, which will do a really cool composer prof- profile on him in a couple episodes. And he was one of the organists at St. Paul's Cathedral. Later he was um, he was made a gentleman uh, of the Royal Chapel. Um, the definition of what a gentleman was back then is kind of convoluted and unclear and has kind of changed over time, kind of like the word motet. You think of a Bach motet, and it's like, whoa, this is really long and really complicated and really hard and really thick. And then you think of a Renaissance motet, and it's different. It's the same thing with the title of gentleman, but it was definitely a big deal and kind of raised his social status to to that of as close to royalty as he could get without actually being royalty. So so for the easy piece by Thomas Morley, as was kind of mentioned by Dr. Crane in that interview, there really is much easier vocal range and vocal techniques in his secular music. So he has an entire book of airs for two voices. Airs are the secular songs. They're for two voices, and they are perfect for emerging choirs, children's choirs, junior high, middle school, elementary, even beginning level high school choirs, your your training choirs would do so well with these. And you could introduce it again by telling it like it's a Taylor Swift breakup song. And there's so many ways you could make it really fun and really cool. Um, you could have them act out the words. Like, again, so many fun things that would actually get them to really love the Renaissance and Thomas Morley. So one of them, um, I actually can't remember if this is in the collection of airs or not, but there's a piece as was mentioned before, Leave Now Mine Eyes. It's two parts, soprano and tenor. You could adjust the tenor part. You could adjust the octave because it doesn't go super high, so you could raise it a couple steps if the boys can't quite sing that low. Or you could have just any two parts sing it in the same octave. It could work great if you split, you know, have the boys on one side, the girls on the other side, and you sing it. It's great dramatic heartbreak song and it's a really good way to introduce them into polyphonic singing and is really uh, the melodies are really distinct and would be quicker to learn than you might think initially polyphony would be to learn and it could easily be doubled by the piano if you would like and if that helps give them a little bit of a boost Uh, an intermediate piece is an another an intermediate piece, a secular one, is April is in my mistress's face, S A T B. There's a lot of great duetting between voices, good imitation. Another great Taylor Swift breakup song, it like starts like it's hopeful, and then it's like April is in my mistress's face. She's so beautiful, but her heart is cold as winter. It's like really hilarious. The ranges aren't that bad. The tenors might get a little bit high, but it doesn't need to be heroic, so they can sing falsetto, no problem. So secular, intermediate piece, April is in my mistress's face. 
uh, sacred version, if you're looking for a more solemn or um, kind of a, a more sacred feeling piece, uh, his burial service is several pieces long, and, and you can pick any of them individually. And I am the resurrection and the life is the first one. And they're pretty short, pretty straightforward. And they could work great for a junior high ensemble and up. There's great moments. It's mostly homophonic, but with some moments of polyphony. It's not really dense. The rhythms are slower. Um, so you could teach sustained singing through that. Um, the burial service would be really great for an intermediate choir. Now on to the advanced piece. The secular advanced piece uh, would be his famous Fire Fire. I only classify this piece as advanced because of the five parts and the tempo. And the polyphony is a little bit more complex. It's probably doable by an intermediate choir, depending on how intermediate people define that differently. But it would probably just take more time. And again, the ranges are a little bit more extreme not a lot, but a little bit. The polyphony is more dense and complex. The tempo is fast, and it's five parts. So it's really fun and really exciting, and it's one of those pieces that once they learn it and it sticks in their bones, they will remember it forever. Um, but that piece is really great. Uh, a secular, or sorry, a sacred piece uh, for advanced choir would be No Lo Mortem Peccatoris for SATB. And this motet is not super long, but it's macaronic, which means it's in two different languages. So the chorus or refrain is in Latin, and the rest is in English. So that's actually really cool to be able to sing both languages. And I think that's really fascinating. And I performed this piece before, and I really it was one of my favorite pieces that semester. So there's also a really great moment of that false relation where the tenors are singing like an F natural and the altos are singing an F sharp at the same time, right where it talks about pain, my painful smart. It's like, oh, my pain and my anguish, and then you have this really harsh dissonance with the leading tone and a lowered seventh at the same time. It's really cool. The British were famous for that false relation, but um, the ranges are a little bit more on the virtuosic side. The polyphony is denser, even though the tempo is slower, but it could really be a great kind of champion piece for a high school chamber or madrigal choir. And that wraps up episode three of Early Music Monday. Be sure to subscribe so you can stay up to date on all Sound of Ages information and Early Music Monday podcasts. And leave us a review, which helps our ratings and helps spread the influence of early music and choral music throughout the country and throughout the region. Had some good thoughts about tone, teaching tone, thinking about tone. Myself included, we can all think about tone a little bit more in our instruction. Had a great conversation with Dr. Andrew Crane and his perspective on how to think about tone even when programming and uh, how to program for an audience. And we learned about Thomas Morley in our composer profile. Thank you so much again for joining us, and we'll catch you next time on Early Music Monday. <laughs>